Welcome, Grant. This is the day the Lord's made. Amen. That's right. You know, we take a lot of things for granted when we come to church in the morning. One thing is our health, just being able to get up and be here. We take that for granted. Number two, the freedom we have in our country to be here this morning. We take that for granted. Now I would say number three, I have family that live out in Washington and Oregon. And they've been told not to go outside. The, the air quality is so bad today with smoke. Yes. They're not in immediate danger, but the air is so bad. So they've been told to stay inside. So just as we come outside today on a beautiful sunny day, right? Got some rain last night. It's a beautiful fall day. Amen. So we take that for granted. So we a lot to be thankful for this morning. We need to remember the people out in California and Oregon and Washington. It's really a bad, bad fire out there. Today we have a theme to not only church, but also we start Sunday school today. And the theme is Christians and their government. What does that mean? How should we get involved in our government? What should be our participation in our government? So that's what we're looking at today through God's Word and also through Sunday School. So I'm looking forward to a great day. Let's open up in prayer. Dear Lord, we are so thankful this morning for so many things. We're thankful for the freedom we have in this country to be here without persecution. We pray for the leaders of our country. We pray for the coming election. Lord, we also pray for the people out on the West Coast who are experiencing just these terrible fires and smoke and air quality. So we pray for rain. We pray for all the people fighting these fires for safety. We just pray for their protection. And Lord, we also pray for our service today, Lord, that as we lift up our voices in song, that we would give glory to you. I pray as we're challenged through your word today, as far as our involvement in our government, our politics. What should be our role as Christians? I just pray that you would challenge us this morning. Again, give us a great day in your house. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. All right. Let's stand and let's worship our King. Amen. Amen. Oh 
Oh.
church. We're going to read this morning from 1 Timothy chapter 2. I urge you then, first of all, all the petitions, prayers, and intercessions, and thanksgiving to be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior. Let's pray before Steve comes up. Our Father in heaven, we are just so thankful for this new day, Lord. As we just sang, uh, we are so thankful that you are a faithful God. We thank you, Lord, that uh, we serve a risen Savior. And, uh, Father, we just pray, Lord, for this day. We pray that you would be honored here and that uh, you would be with Brother Steve as he brings forth the word. Just bless his words. And uh, I just pray for each and every one of us, Lord, that we would grow closer to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good morning, Berean. Are you awake out there this morning? Before I introduce the sermon uh, today, I'd like to share three verses from the book of Judges that led me to do this message today. We've been talking the last few weeks about the miraculous victory that God had over the Midianites. How he used Gideon, if you remember the story, 32,000 men, reduced to 10,000, reduced to 300. All the men had were trumpets, torches, and jars. They surrounded the enemy camp, and God, in a miraculous way, divine intervention, won the battle. And the glory went to God, or did it. Because what happened is... After that great victory, Gideon became like a rock star among the people. People came up to Gideon. And in Judges 8.22, they said this. The Israelites said to Gideon, Rule over us, you and your son and your grandson, because you have saved us from the hand of Midian. You have. And if you remember last week, Gideon, first of all, he did refuse this. He made a wise choice and said, God should rule over you. But he lived like a king. He made, he got this great big ephod, this high priest garment. He collected a lot of jewelry, silver and gold and linen, purple linen. And people actually started, started to worship that ephod, and they worship it as an idol. People thought that Gideon was the answer to the problems. Gideon, if you're our king, all of our problems will be solved. Now, sometimes in the United States, we're guilty of thinking that if our politician that we like gets voted into office, all of our problems will be solved. That's wrong. That's wrong. Judges 2.10, another verse early, it says, After that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, they're referring to the a generation of Joshua, another generation grew up who neither knew the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Every time I read that verse, another generation grew up who neither knew the Lord or what he had done. I think of the United States. I think of our next generation. I think of my grandkids. What type of country are my grandkids going to grow up in? The last verse in Judges 21, 25. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. Your translation might say, everyone did what was right 
in his own eyes. Breaking news, in case you don't know. There's an election coming up in November. I was going to my mailbox yesterday, getting the mail out, and my neighbor was across the street, and I was flipping through my mail. I go, oh, I didn't know there was an election coming up. <laughs> but there is. There's an, and it's a very, very important time. And are we guilty like the Israelites? Are we guilty at times of putting too much trust, too much faith into our leaders instead of our God? Our number one devotion should be to our Lord and Savior. Last time I checked, Jesus was not an elephant or a donkey. But you know what? He is a lion and a lamb. And he's also the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So he's the one that should get our top priority as far as our trust in our faith. But the question is, as a Christian, what should be our commitment or involvement in politics and in our government? What should be our responsibility? Now, personally, I got off to a terrible start, I think, in politics. 1974, um, I was a senior at Warren Cusno. Little Jim Dykla, he was just a little freshman waiting to come into the school. And we went to the same high school. And uh, I was a senior going out, and he was just a youngster coming in. But it was a huge school. And we were told, uh, or we had to, public school, we had to read a book that year. The name of the book was, Who Runs Congress? And the answer is, Big business runs Congress. Lobbyists runs Congress. That's the book I read. So right away I started thinking, oh boy, you know, again, big public school. But I turned 18 in high school. I was one of the few people who turned 18 while I was in high school. I don't know how that happened. I mean, 12th grade was the best four years of my life. No, just kidding, just kidding. I just... I was older and I turned 18. I could vote. So I remember. And I remember my first presidential vote was 1976. And I did my research. I really did my research. And I had to vote for either Gerald Ford or Jimmy Carter. Now, come on. Gerald Ford, University of Michigan football player. Right? Okay. Or Jimmy Carter. So I did all my research, and I went down to my local elementary school to vote. And we had voting booths. Do you remember voting booths? And there was a long line. I had my great big paper because there was like 50 things to vote on. I did research. I stuffed it into my pocket, and I was ready to go. This 90-year-old little lady escorted me to the voting booth, and a curtain closed behind me. And there was a long line of people behind me. So the first one was the president. So I put the lever down and it popped back up. So I said, oh, okay. So I got my piece of paper out and I voted my 50 different things. And every time the lever went down, I pushed it back up. It says when you're done voting, pull the crank and you exit. I pulled the crank, but nothing happened. So I, I pulled the crank again, nothing happened. I'm stuck in the voting booth. What am I doing wrong? So I opened up the curtain to the nine-year-old lady and said, Ma'am, I need your help. Sir, I can, it's against the law for me to help you. Figure it out yourself. All the people behind her, they don't look too happy right now. So I went, I realized I made a mistake that the lever's got to stay down. So I had to reboot. And then I opened up the curtain, and then I walked out like this. <laughs> and of course, that year, well, actually the year before that, I mean, Watergate came out. I entered college. I took American government in college. My teacher came out, you know, really long hair, blue jeans, glasses, and he said, uh, I'm your American government teacher this year now. I am a Marxist, 
but I'll be very objective on how I teach American government. So that was my introduction into politics. It got off to a little bit of a rough start. And I'm thinking, you know, how involved should I be in that? Turn in your Bibles to uh, Romans 13. Romans 13. Let's take a look at what scriptures say about government and our involvement in it. Romans 13, verses 1 and 2. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. From these verses, we see that God has ordained government. God has ordained government, and we shouldn't have a rebellious, antagonistic attitude towards our leaders. Nothing happens that God has not authorized. Let's take a look at verse 3. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoers. The purpose of government, they're, they're God's stewards, they're God's representatives to prevent wrongdoing. The great theologian Augustine said this, that government is a necessary evil, that it is necessary because of evil. Govern government is necessary because we're sinful people. We do wrong things. Now, sometimes government becomes sinful because they just reflect the sinful society. But the purpose of government is to restrain evil and to maintain and uphold and protect the sanctity of life. And we are called by, by God as, as Christians to respect those in authority over us. And whether government officials realize this or not, they're God's servants. They play a major role, and they're God's servants, and God has put them in that position. What's scary is sometimes we see that unjust people take those positions. And that is a little scary. But... Generally speaking, if you do what is right, you shouldn't be afraid. If you do what is wrong, you should be afraid. This should motivate us to pray for our leadership, too. If we need to pray for our if you pray for the leadership, you're going to follow them closer, too. And that's very important. Sometimes, though, the government actually can become an agent in doing wrong. And that's, that's the tricky situation because they're ordained by God to, again, uh, do away with evil, promote goodness. If they're doing wrong themselves, as Christians, are we obligated to follow that? And that's the question that we're discussing today. Take a look at, uh, again, we're in Romans 13, 5 through 7. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. 
God has given us the Holy Spirit. We have a conscience. Our conscience should be influenced by the Holy Spirit. And we need to obey those in leadership. We need to submit to them. Unless they forbid us to do something that is contrary to God's word. But the basic position in the New Testament is to be submissive and to be obedient as citizens of the, of the state. We need to pray for those in leadership. But it's always those situations that we'll be talking about in a few minutes where if they tell you to do something that is against God's word, then we're obligated to follow God rather than man. Now, Jim read the portion in um, 2 Timothy today, and you'll see it over here, 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 3. We are to pray, and, and we can all start here. Then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. Um, for, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God, our Savior. One of the things with this passage is sometimes we only pray for politicians that we agree with. Does it say that? Does it say, <laughs> does it say there that we should pray only for those in the political party that we support? No, it says pray for all. And I think we all can do it better. I know I can do a better as far as doing that, praying for all of our politicians. We often hear the term separation of church and state, right? And that's a very, it's often been misinterpreted uh, throughout the years. Um, I was doing, you know, a little bit of reading on it yesterday, and it's, it, the phrase itself is not even in the Constitution. It's, it's implied in the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights. In fact, Thomas Jefferson early in the 1800s, wrote a letter to a Baptist church where he talked about this, the separation of church and state, where it does not allow the state to rule the church or the church to rule the state. Our founding fathers did not want something like the Church of England, you know, running everything and the influence of, of both. But historically, it meant that both the church and the state are answerable to God. Now, yes, the church, we answer to God, but the way this has been taken out of proportion, it seems like the state is answerable to no one. And that's one of the problems. In fact, not only are they not answerable to, to no one, they, they want nothing to do with God. So they, they, they've taken everything out of the government. But the separation of the church and state, and we'll talk more about that as, as time goes on. But God monitors government. God raises up governments. He brings down governments. And every human government is accountable to God because there are God's representatives in doing good. But when government is no longer acting justly, when government is no longer protecting life, when they're no longer promoting the sanctity of life, when they promote abortions and so on, then the church, we need to be a voice in the community. We need to take a stand and we need to, to make express that that is wrong to the state as God commands us to do. I like um, Peter. Uh, if you have your uh, Bibles, of course, it's right above me. Take a look at 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, verse 13. 1 Peter 2, 13. Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. 
Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Now, some people would take this as a blanket statement where it says, submit to all those. Does that mean we have to submit to government no matter what they say? I want to bring your attention to who wrote this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This is Peter who wrote this. Do you remember Peter in Acts 4 and 5? He was going around preaching the gospel. And he was arrested by the Jewish leaders, the Sanhedrin and the authorities. And Peter was given strict orders. We do not want you to preach the gospel. Strict orders. Now remember, this is the same Peter that we just read. Do you know what Peter told those in authority? He said this, We must obey God rather than human beings. We have to obey God rather than human beings. This is the same Peter. So when it says submit to authorities, that's not a blanket statement in every situation. Yeah, there's times where we have the Holy Spirit. We have a conscience. If the government is telling, to do, telling us to do something that's contrary to God's word, we have to make a choice. And I hope when we're faced with that choice that we'll have the courage, as Peter did, to stand up for what is right. Now, I know personally sometimes I get intimidated by government. Like when government tells me to do something, I, I feel like you cannot fight City Hall. I'm intimidated. Jesus standing before Pilate. There's a great couple of verses. It's John chapter 19. And Pilate is asking Jesus questions. And Jesus is standing quiet in, under the questioning. And in verse 10, Pilate says this, Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said, Don't you realize I have the power either to free you or to crucify you? Do you see what Pilate is saying here? He doesn't know who he's talking to. He's talking to the Son of God, and Pilate is saying, do you realize that I have the power, don't you realize that I have the power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered in verse 11, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of greater sin. Jesus is saying, you have no power over me. I mean, Yes, my father has put you into power, but there's a whole plan behind this. There's a whole purpose behind this. I, I came here to die on the cross for the sins of the people. And you're just an instrument that's being used in God's plan. So there, there's no power. You know, Pilate thought he had all this authority. No, he didn't have authority. So, you know, our responsibility... Yes, God is sovereign. God is in control. Our responsibility is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. And in most cases, when we follow that, we have nothing to fear from our government until government tells us to do things that are contrary to God's word. Romans 8.31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? Now, when you do take a stand, you have to realize something. There might be consequences. It says that, you know, that they're given a sword, and sometimes they're quick to use that sword for a reason. For Peter, for example, yeah, he was put into jail. He was beaten. That came along with him taking the stand. So we have to remember that when we do take a stand, that there could be some consequences. Let's talk about TV news for a second. Now, there's a face. 
Walter Cronkite. That's when the news was the news. Now you have stations that go 24-7 and all they do is talk about politics. And are they reporting the news or are they giving an editorial about the news? They're probably giving an editorial about the news. Walter, Walter Cronkite was voted one time the most trusted man in America. The most trusted man in America. And <laughs> yeah, it's like he, he just gave the news, right? The facts. And we do have to be careful. Uh, I, I tell my wife sometimes, I say, be careful. I see her, you know, she's getting a little, the blood pressure gets going a little bit, a little anxiousness. Be careful. Be careful you don't watch the news too much. Because sometimes, if, especially if you're hearing one side, it can, it can sort of get to you, right? But one thing that we do see, we do see that many of the freedoms that we have to obey God are actually being undermined and eroded before our very eyes. And the freedom to speak the truth, uh, to preach the word, um, follow our convictions, evangelize the world, you see some of these rights being taken away from us. And you see that, you know, you see that in, in the courts, in the public square. Uh, you see it in our educational systems. You certainly see it in the media. You see it in the media. But we have to remember, the governing authorities have been established by God. And we need to pray for our leaders. We cannot be troublemakers. But when it comes to a choice between right and wrong, we have to have the courage to make the right choice. I think there are times that Christians, including, I mean, I put myself in this, we have become uh, spectators more than participants. We sort of sit back and we see many of our freedoms taken away from us. And yes, we like to discuss them, we complain about it. But what are we doing about it? What is the church you know, doing about it. One thing I was reminded of as I studied this week is if America falls, if America falls, you have to remember, what does America do for other countries? When there's a tragedy or a, a catastrophic event somewhere in the world, who's the first country to help? America. When we see people being um, uh, oppressed or, or people going hungry. It's the United States, spiritually speaking, our country was really, at one time, the main country for sending out missionaries throughout the whole world. So if America falls, other countries are going to be uh, affected as well. So we have to, to remember that. And are we willing to make sacrifices like our founding fathers did? as far as protecting our freedoms in this country. I think of, you know, as my dad was attacking the beaches in World War II and bullets were flying all over his head in, in the South Pacific, what was he fighting for? He was fighting for our freedom, right? And what are we doing as a country? Do we just want to sit back and watch all those freedoms being taken away from us? Or do we want to go out and do something? You know, it's, it's sort of a slap in the face to our founding fathers. The, num the number, I mean, obviously, we need to vote. We need to vote, number one. We need to pray. I should say we need to pray, number one. As Jim read that passage in Timothy, we need to pray. Number two, we need to vote. Um, in the last election, I saw a survey, and I know surveys are misleading, and... I saw a survey that startled me, that four years ago, 40%, 40% of all Christians did not vote. And first of all, whenever I see that, what did they define as a Christian? I don't know what that means. How did they get 40%? No matter what, that's a big number. 40%, and I think it's a disgrace 
that God has provided us a way, a simple way, to approve or disapprove of our elected officials. It's voting. And if we don't get out and vote, I mean, Thomas Jefferson said this, we don't have a government by the majority. We have government by the majority who participate. So if you sit back home and you don't vote, you're missing a great opportunity. Voting is a critical role in, in the course of our nation. What would our nation look like if every Christian prayed for our leaders and if every Christian went out and voted? What would our country look like? So... Part of our Sunday school today, we're going to be interviewing a couple people from our church that have gotten involved with politics. So that's in Sunday school. But we have one guy in our church that is so, so busy. He's the busiest man in the world. And I had to grab him before he left. So I'm going to call Ron up. Ron, Ron, come up here for a second because we're talking about... Um, being a spectator or a participant. Mike, is that uh, on? Uh, Ron, you can stand up here. And, and Ron, I, I look at you as a uh, participant. You're not a spectator. You see something you don't like and you want to do something about it. So I want you to explain. I know recently you started a petition about something you disagreed with. I want you to just, I'm only going to give you a few minutes now. <laughs> I want you to say, what uh, moved you to start the petition and how did you start a petition? How did you start the petition? Well, first it's, uh, something's got to be near and dear to your heart. So you got to feel it calling, whether it be, um, you know, uh, getting involved with child ministry or, or helping the elderly that, uh, I started realizing what I did to air my way and started seeing 
Amen. <laughs> You started a petition, though, right? You started a petition. How, how, do you, how do you start a petition? Well, first, again, you, you, you find someone who's already got some big goal. Okay. So I go to those people because they already, they've got their foundation already okay. laid. Get involved with that there. Okay. And be a part of their already successful mission. Okay. And that's their goal. You know, I didn't think it was me taking care of them. I started this process. I get involved with some things. I go to go to the dream cruise. I hold a sign out. The guy out there holding the big board some signs, wave my hand. You know, Ryan is, Ryan is an example of a person who is a participant. God. You know, we all can vote. We all can pray. But is there something else we can do? Now, I, I do have one more ver verse I want to share. But when you come to Sunday school, I'm going to have two other people talk from our church. And they're people that don't sit on the sidelines, okay? So I think that that's important. But I do want to share one verse with you in, in closing. Proverbs 25, 26. I love this verse. Like a mudded spring or a polluted well are the righteous who give way to the wicked. What that verse says that if you're a righteous person and you just sit back and your standards of right and wrong just you make compromises with the world and you just sit back and do nothing and you watch the whole everything go downhill you're like a mudded spring or a polluted well we need to do something as a church we need to you know and, and again I'm, I'm speaking to myself number one um, I think a lot of times I'm more spectator than participant so I think the challenge for today is as Christians, yes, we need to respect. We need to submit to our government. We need to pray for our government. We're not to be troublemakers or rebellious. But when we start seeing our freedoms and our rights from our found, founding fathers being taken away from us, we need to take a stand. We need to be more vocal. So that's how this has convicted me. And again, our... Our trust, number one, is in the Lord. Our trust, number one. The answer to the problems in this world is not government. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. The problem is sin. The solution is Jesus Christ. And we need to remember that, number one. And just like our money says, in God we trust. In God we trust, right? Let's close in prayer. Dear Lord, I pray that you would take these passages of scripture today and really speak to us. Lord, we, we thank you for the freedom that we have in the United States. We thank you for the founding fathers and all those who made so many sacrifices for us to have freedom of religion um, and just our, our whole constitution, how it's set up. Lord, I pray that you would give us wisdom on how we can be more active and more involved in our government. I just pray that as a church that we would not just sit and stand still and just watch things happen, but that we would be more actively involved. Speak to each individual today. Lord, again, we thank you. We thank you that you're sovereign. We thank you that you're in control. 
And we continue to pray for our election coming up, that your will would be done. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.